At the end of the month, I'm off the board. You won't have to listen to this anymore. Okay. Just for the fun of it, let me read you the name of the uh, members of the International Service Committee. It's a large committee, and there's lots of opportunity for more. Randy Ayer, Gene Banks, Marty Banks, Jim Bromley, Vicki Davison, Linda Cruz, Scott Leckman, Mark Maxfield, Dwayne Millard, Doug Mortensen, John Pace, uh, Sandra Poyler, Shri Sharma, Paul Stringham, Jan Stuckey, Tom Thatcher, Roger Thompson, Devin Thorpe, Pearl Wright, Henry Wirtz, John Zacchio. Lots of great Rotarians there who have an interest in international service. Um, we'll na I'll now turn the microphone to the committee chair, Doug Mortensen, and he'll announce the rest of the program. Thank you. Ten days or nine days, uh, Paul Stringham is going to replace me as, as chair of this committee. And I have to say, I'd like to say, as I'm the outgoing chairman, that I have really had my eyes open uh, by a few people who have been so proactive in solving problems you wouldn't even think about in other countries that uh, it's to me it's kind of mind-boggling. Four of these people aren't here today. Uh, Shri Sharma's up at the university uh, listening to the uh, Dalai Lama. Scott Lechman's in India. Um, Paul, Paul Stringham can't be here because he has uh, a commitment he has to the uh, youth in his area. And uh, who else is there? Oh, Dwayne. Uh, oh, Dwayne's here. <laughs> okay. Well, he's one of them. The most impressive. Another one who did, uh, does, and who best illustrates what I'm talking about is uh, Mohammed Saeed. Now, if you have been attentive in prior uh, meetings where the International Service Committee has told you, you know, you'll know a little bit about this. Uh, Mo, Mo's brother uh, sustains a very serious uh, neurological injury in, America, in Morocco, where he lived. And uh, Mo, took over his care and uh, found that there, he couldn't get any of the treatment he needed in that country, so he took him to Paris. And the care that he got in Paris was also unsatisfactory, so he brought his brother here to Salt Lake. And he got great care here. And that led to, uh, under Mo's uh, careful guidance, to the establishment of a uh, neuro rehabilitation care center in Morocco. And we've had physicians and therapists and others from the University of Utah go over there and not only treat the patients, but train the care providers there to provide treatment. And that, that's been a while. And there have been a, a lot, some of your money and a lot of uh, Rotary International money and other people's money brought into making this a uh, huge facility. But Dwayne just got back from Morocco where Mo gave him a first hand tour of the facility. And you should stick around and uh, listen to Dwayne rave to you about uh, the great experience he had. What a great facility that is. Uh, now, I have here, what do you do? Kathy, a seven page speech, and it's a really good speech. <laughs> Jokes, you know, stuff to make you cry, everything. But I'm going to avoid that because one of my. Uh, Big irritations is when the main speaker gives a great message and there's not time to ask questions. I want to make sure that happens today. Uh, we've had a lot of projects. I do, I do want to say one thing about our dengue fever. You're, I know you're thinking, oh, dengue fever, what's that got to do with that? Well, these folks in uh, Thailand, I just run through that one copy. We helped them get this first uh, global grant that was hugely successful, so successful that they now have obtained a second grant, Rotary International Grant, and they have involved, I know, I'm doing it on purpose. Just, you can see things, right? Um, this is to show you how, how much they've got their act together over there. And they've involved school children, they have contests. They help the school children spread the word about fight the bike. 
they found herbs there that they can make repellents out of that are successful. And um, yeah, there you go. Uh, here's what I wanted to say. The same, the same mosquito that carries the dengue fever virus in the is the mosquito that carries the Zika virus. And in all of Thailand, as of last Friday, was that the 16th? Okay. There were a total of six cases of Zika illness in all of Thailand. This thing's working. Someday, dengue fever, like polio, will be wiped out from the from the uh, face of the earth, and you can we can say that we were on the ground floor of, of that effort to wipe it out. Now we have talked about projects, and all these projects we've been working on, we think are you know big projects, but they're nothing compared to the huge one that Mark Maxfield has in mind. And um, we've always talked about uh, stamping out polio. Well, these guys are talking about stamping out poverty worldwide through a program of <laughs> self-reliance training. And uh, Mark Maxfield will now introduce our main speaker on that topic. Now, if you want to hear my speech, and there's plenty of time at the end. <laughs> oh yeah, wait a sec, Tim's first, I forgot. Tim is here to tell you about a, a possible, what you can do in Cambodia this coming February. And please give her a pause, and while you are, I will turn to her slides. So you've seen all my slides now. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been perfectly fine if you had passed me over. But I just appreciate being here and I appreciate the experiences that Paul has had with you Rotarians and just you make such a big difference. And you made such a big difference in Cambodia. And as you know, Paul and I love Cambodia. It's very dear to our heart. And this February in Cambodia, there we're having a group of people internationally that are coming, Rotarians that are going to be gathering in Persat, where we've done our projects and where we have contributed money. And so Paul will take a group of you who want to go, so I'm hoping lots of you want to go, to <coughs> Cambodia. And you will go to the Killing Fields, you'll go to Angkor Wat, and then you'll go to um, Persat, where we've done, where you have done all the projects, or your money has gone to the projects. I guess I can push the pictures. But these are just some of the projects, the pictures of the projects that you have funded um, and have made such a difference. So in Cambodia, they will have Rotarians from Canada, from Florida, from Australia, and then the Persat group there in Persat, Cambodia. And you will be able to meet together. And it's Rotary is a big deal in Cambodia, in this group, in this area, because you've made such a difference. And I actually was able to go to a, a Rotary program there, a meeting there, while we were in Cambodia a year ago. And it's a big deal, and they take it really serious, and they wear their, their jackets, and they have their rotary, their rotary badges or whatever. I mean, they, it's a big deal to them. And, and so this would be a wonderful opportunity for you to be able to go to Cambodia and to, to see what you've done, see what your money has done. You'll be able to see the areas that you've gone to and also, or that your money has gone to, sorry. That's why you need Paul here, because he's better at speaking. And then also you'll have a chance of working a day or two if you would like to in on a project with the other Rotarians, the international Rotarians. So I just think it would be a fabulous opportunity for you if you want to take advantage of that. And Paul would love to have you go with him. Yes. What's the cement thing that we're showing? Those actually are their water catchments. And they're, they're put together as a globe. And you have, it comes off of a, you have a corrugated tin roof and the little catchment that goes into the globe. Because half of the year in Cambodia, you have tons of water. The other half of the year, you have nothing. So during the, the rainy season, that water is able to be caught and and used for, the, for drinking. So come see it. Come see what you've done. We'd love to have you come. It would be a great experience. And you won't get sick from the food, just so you know, and you'll be in decent hotels. So. If you have any concerns, you can talk to me after. If I can survive it, any of you can. Well, 
Dean is getting ready uh, with his slides. <clears throat> I just want to uh, say that it's been a real pleasure for me to learn so much from the International Service Committee members. I love what Paul's doing in Cambodia and uh, what everyone in this committee has done in other parts of the world. Um, as you know, I was the executive director of Eagle Condor Humanitarian uh, for five years and also was on their board for another five years. And during those 10 years, I learned a lot about um, parachute humanitarianism, where people go down and just pet a peasant for a day and take pictures, throw around some clothes, and feel like they've done a lot of good. And, and really, they didn't really help at all. All they did was uh, get people to smile for a little moment and then leave. And so I, I started studying to find out what we really could do to help eliminate poverty rather than just uh, enable people in other ways. And one of the things I found was uh, some materials that were put together by Interweave Solutions. And they start with establishing self-reliant groups and teaching people how to, to become self-reliant in, in several different areas. And so I asked Dean if we could use his materials at Eagle Condor Humanitarian. And he not only donated his materials, but he actually donated some money. And we did a partnership with the LDS Church, with, with Dean Curtis, and with uh, the local governments and Eagle Condor Humanitarian, we were able to start these self-reliant associations and have a great success down there. And based on this success in these three or four areas, um, I proposed to our International Service Committee, why don't we take on Peru? And since the government there is very supportive of what we're trying to do, and let's try to take our program and start it in all 20 regions of Peru and work with local Rotarians down there and work with the local government work with the LDS Church and other churches, and work with NGOs. And so I'm very excited to have you here from Dean Curtis. I'll just give you a little information about Dean. <clears throat> He's the chairman of the board and co-founder of Interweave Solutions, a nonprofit organization that moves people from poverty to prosperity through neighborhood self-reliant groups. Interweave has worked with many NGOs to help promote to people become self-reliant. Interweave currently has two major contracts with the LDS Church, helping create self-reliant groups throughout the LDS Church's new Self-Reliant Services and Perpetual Education Fund. Interweave has also worked with Choice International, Mentors International, Eagle Condor Humanitarian, and other NGOs, helping create self-reliant groups throughout worldwide. Interweave recently started the Masters of Business in the Street, a certificate program for street vendors and farmers in the informal economy. Interweave has over 150 success ambassadors being trained online on how to start their own MBS program to train self-reliance to the business businesses in the street. Hunters now have received their MBS certificates with thousands to come. Prior to organizing Interweave Solutions, Dean sold his business of over 500 employees. This made it possible to donate all of Interweave's administrative costs, so all outside donations go directly to work in the field. <laughs> Dean has served as president of the Tampico Mission, uh, LDS Mission, and prior to funding, founding his company, he was professor at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, is that it? and also taught high school at Spanish Fort Chi. Dean is author of, of the book, Charity with a Bottom Line, Business with a Heart. He has 80 copies of this book here, and he will gladly give you a copy and sign it for you if you are interested after his, his remarks. He is the father of nine children and has plenty of grandchildren. With this, with his enthusiasm, when, he, when I told him I wanted to do this, uh, this uh, uh, test pilot project for Rotary down in Peru, and hopefully if it goes well, maybe approach Rotary International and see if they'll take us on worldwide. I checked into the polio program and how it started. And online, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but at the 30th anniversary, they had an interview with the person who started the polio, the Style Ball Polio Project. And it was one Rotarian that had that idea. And I thought, you know, if we could take this next 30 years and try to stamp out poverty the same way that we've taken off polio, I think that would help the world in a great way. So let's give a good hand to Dean Curtis. Thank you. What an honor to be here. It's uh, great to be able to hear about some of the service that people are doing around the world. I had a chance to talk to Pearl, and she works with Choice. There's other people who are doing the work that you explained in, in Cambodia, in uh, India, in Morocco. Thank you for, for your service. What an honor. I talked to Doug last night on the phone. He was checking with me to see make sure I had my computers and everything, and he shared a similar vision to what Mark just said. He said, you know, uh, the Rotary Clubs were an integral part of helping to eradicate polio. Wouldn't it be great if the Rotary Clubs would be an integral part or forefront in eradicating poverty? Poverty with self-reliance. 
And I'm glad he added that term self-reliance because I've, I've struggled to try to <coughs> alleviate poverty. Uh, after I worked at the University of Nebraska for several years, I started a business. In that business, it was a business to uh, work with government <coughs> agencies in the United States to help people find work. And uh, we taught people on welfare how to get jobs. If they got the job, I would get paid, the person would have a job, and the government would have someone off welfare. It went really well, and I noticed one thing that was very important. In order to really reform welfare and help people get off work, or to get to work, you needed jobs. Well, after I sold the business, I went to lived in Mexico for three years. And when I came back, I noticed it's a little bit different there in Mexico. In Mexico, you can't just go fill out your resume and go get a job. And this was true in many places internationally, because there is not a lot of formal education. And in fact, many people can actually say, 35 and under only, if you're older 35, you need not apply. And you can discriminate uh, for, for whatever reason you want to. And there's no formal employment in many cases. I came back from that uh, three-year time, and I thought, how can I contribute to true self-reliance? And I thought, maybe what I could do, since I've worked in the business world for a while, but I was helping people become self-reliant by finding jobs, could I help people be self-reliant by helping create jobs? I started joining uh, several organizations after the mission, and I said to myself, I want to be part of International. I want to help. And I found something that would happen, and here's ways you don't want to be helping people in poverty. And I've struggled with this as to what is the correct way. I was helping a group in Nicaragua set up a small business on how to uh, sell reading glasses. Most of us get uh, presbyopia, presbyopia around 45 years old. That's where you need longer arms to be able to read. And uh, it happens to all of us, it's pretty common. You can solve it with simple reading glass, glasses. But if you don't know about presbyopia, and if you don't know that your eyes are getting bad and all you have to do is get a reading glass, then what you might think is you have to go to a uh, optometrist, pay a lot of money, get glasses, and if you're poor, you can't afford to do that. So about 45 years old, a lot of people drop out of the marketplace. They can't thread the needles, they can't thread the fishing hooks, and they began to uh, not be able to provide. It was a great business idea in which we would train people simply about the disease, help them with some uh, economical reading glasses, but then someone heard about this need, and so a philanthropist, a good, meaning, well-meaning person came and said, let me help. And so, didn't talk out, but let me help, and through the church there in Chinandegua, Nicaragua, uh, through a church, he donated 3,000 glasses reading glasses. Everyone was all excited. Everyone came. And pretty soon, everyone was happy with reading glasses except for one problem. These five entrepreneurs that were trying to start up reading glass business were just wiped out financially. There was no business anymore. Why buy a pair of glasses at a very economical price when they're for free? So they dropped out. All the connections were destroyed and all the, the suppliers and so on. About two years later, people started asking again, Oh, my glasses are broken. More people started turning 45 years old. And pretty soon, they had no source for reading glasses and no source for simple education in the street. And so what did they do? Well, last time we solved the problem by someone coming down, parachuting in, and giving us reading glasses. I know how we'll solve this. We'll look for other people to donate. Now, where was self-reliance? And so I thought to myself many times, when... We help people. We often make the mistake of hurting business and self-reliance. It's happened with clothing as well, used clothing when we dump used clothing, and we often destroy a marketplace. When we, uh, fishing nets, main article in Africa, not fishing nets, uh, mosquito nets. Uh, we want to give everyone a fish or a mosquito net to save them from malaria. Sure enough, we have a, uh, a mosquito net person working there, and then we dump mosquito nets in, those businesses are destroyed, and then they turn looking for the next set of mosquito nets. In order for us to truly eradicate poverty, we've got to deal with self-reliance. And so what is self-reliance? I wanted to show you this one person just getting started, Jorge Caraval. Uh, he, uh, about 25 years old, I've been asked, why do you spend so much time internationally? We've got plenty of problems locally. Why don't you stick around locally? I do know that if we can solve some international problems with true self-reliance, 
we're going to solve some pretty important domestic problems, one of them being immigration. This particular gentleman, about 25, graduated from college in Cholutec, Honduras, decided his next step would be to go get a job. And where do you get a job? The United States. And so he got on a train, he went in to get a job, because you don't get him in Choluteca. You don't get him in Honduras. And so he was going on the train, he fell off the train, he uh, lost his arms, you'll notice there. He lost uh, one of his legs, both of them are uh, uh, prosthesis legs and arms. And he came back to Choluteca, discouraged, waiting, how can he get back to go where there's jobs? At that point, he joined a, a, an international self-reliance group, we call them self-reliance groups, in which we taught them how to organize businesses, very simple process of teaching. And then instead of, because he couldn't get a, he didn't want to go back into the, the wilderness of trying to get on the train and so on, instead of, he set up his own business. He had one bag of uh, uh, maize or uh, corn, and this is his office now. You notice it's pretty full. And so he uh, is opening up a second office, has six employees, has no intention of coming here illegal or illegal or anything else because he has hope, because he's self-reliant, he's taking care of poverty, and he's creating business. So what is poverty? What is self-reliance? We know that we found out that you can't just train people in business. It's important to teach them basic principles of business. But if there's problems, if they take their money and they start drinking it all away, if they don't spend their money on education for the kids, if they're not teaching each other how to learn and, and work together as a family, often you'll still have poverty. If you have income and if you have even a decent family life, but the community has so much crime or so much uh, problems with water or problems with um, uh, garbage, then you also cannot run a business. So we found in this past 10 years that we've been working on true poverty through self-reliance is that you've got to get people into self-reliance groups, help them create their own businesses, but also help them create plans for their home and how to improve their home life and how to improve their community. In some ways, mini chambers of commerce or mini rotary club, mini service clubs where you get together 10 to 15 people and then more and more and they begin to solve their own problems. So let me talk about the business really quickly. We found that when you try to teach business, if you look up uh, M uh, Masters of Business or if you look up Small Business Training on the internet, very difficult to find material that isn't written for the developed world. I was asked to do a presentation first in Uganda and I was ready with all my, uh, my uh, PowerPoints and my SWOT analysis and variable and, and fixed costs and so on. I got there and we literally had to knock the ch chickens off the table. There was no electricity. We were dealing with the second and third language. English would be the second and third language. They endured the gringos as we talked. Uh, the North Americans that came in, they fed us a nice lunch. And I remember getting on the plane and thinking, they got nothing out of that. I sure enjoyed the trip, but they got nothing out of that. How can we teach people business who can barely read and write? That's the real goal. And so what we did is we said, here's the six principles of business that we're going to shrink it all down to. Plan, product, pick a product you're going to do, pick some kind of a process, we call it the six P's, a price, how to promote it, and then your paperwork. And then you'll notice in this one, we're teaching in Bolivia, they're actually standing up teaching, holding those six P's, and we build this structure just around the simple six P's of business. This person is Deborah, she's in the Congo, she, uh, I'm going to show you just a little bit. You won't understand. Well, some of you might speak French. I don't understand. But I want you to look at that business and think to yourself, if you were a consultant, what would you do to help her improve her business? She's selling some fish. She's also cooking up some, uh, those are, are little uh, bakery goods. She also sells charcoal in the background. And then in addition, you'll notice there's a little bit of rice that she's selling. Uh, if you'll notice her promotion, think those six P's for a second. What's her promotion? What's her pricing? What are her products? And then help her analyze her business. Now, it's a little bit challenging. Notice at the very bottom of there, there's her uh, promotion. Those are her prices right there on a used piece of cardboard. They brainstormed together, not with me. I didn't even speak the language, but they taught the principles, and then they brainstormed as a group. How can we improve one of those six Bs? They came up with promotion. She borrowed a used marker. She found a used uh, cardboard box and put her prices and fish on little signs on telephone poles around the neighborhood. 
and was able to over double her income with her plan for promotion. Now, could you imagine the Masters of Business Administration teaching? The first thing you got to do is get some used cardboard and put it on your uh, telephone poles. That's how you promote. It wouldn't compute in our world, would it? But it, commuted, it computed in that world with that group working self-reliance to teach and support each other. Paperwork's an important process. This is in Bolivia. We'll often ask a business, tell me about your business, which really means show me your books. Now those are very simple books. What do you spend? What do you get for income? And if they can show you <coughs> books, they're usually smiling. They now know how to talk business. And that's the idea of, I always will go and say, show me your paperwork. She's in the Congo. She buys bread from a bakery. And then she has about 15 ladies that come and sell the bread around the country, around her neighborhood. Now, in order to do this, to teach the six Bs, we create self-reliance groups. Self-reliance groups, this is one in Mexico, in Punto Pongasco. And the lady is training the group. We teach the people to teach themselves. Give them a simple book. Give them a simple flip chart, which they can use. We thought we were really fancy and had PowerPoints at first. But half the people don't have electricity, so that didn't work. They didn't have projectors, so we give them uh, flip charts. Here we are in, uh, in a church in, uh, um, in Lake Titicaca. That uh, TV in the back is great, except it just doesn't work. Here's one in Ecuador, uh, as they've all met together. And here's one even in the United States. This is the Marshallese, a group of uh, people who speak Marshall. I guess that's from the island. And they're learning self-reliance and how to start their businesses in here. This is one of those good people who are collecting some money that she had sold to one of the people in the group, some, uh, some dinners that they had sold. So first of all, you get them together and you teach them in a self-reliance group. Then you help them with the principles, the basic principles of how to fish, if you will, in this day and age, how to create a simple business. Then you teach them how to do service. In this particular example, in the Congo, the road goes halfway and then it's mud, way back down there at the bottom, the very top of the picture. On this other side, that road is only one way. They decided, let's solve our own problems. This is their way of constructing the road. And that's not perfect. It's not something the United States would do. They just got their rocks and started throwing in some cement. They do one cement bag at a time and they're solving their problem. And that's self-reliance, poverty through self-reliance. Here's one that's interesting. This is a group in Bolivia uh, that is not a person, that is a, um, what, a doll or a, a, a dummy. They hang that up there at the, uh, in their neighborhood, and the sign basically says, if you steal, you die. Welcome to our neighborhood. No thieves here. Uh, and that is their way to enforcing the crime issues. Now, would you plan for that here? No. In our research, do we say, oh, the best thing to do is hang a bunch of dummies on the telephone poles so we can threaten our people? No. Local problem, local solution solved by the social, uh, the self-reliance group. This is a group of some people visiting a, uh, just doing mentoring, where they're looking at the six Ps and how she can help her business. Now, one thing we always try to do is just celebrate success. After about four years, this group, for example, uh, had a, there's several groups in Uganda, they thought they'd just get together and have a big f a festival to share each other things that they had learned in their group. Now this one, I didn't understand a word they were saying. Oops. I didn't understand a word that they were saying, but uh, I pushed the wrong button here. Where'd that go? But anyway, as they sang, they had pictures. Let's see, my, oh, I can go back. As they sang, <sighs> As they sang, I thought, well, what are they learning? But then pretty soon, they got out their sheet of paper. There, there's their, and now they're teaching people about basic agricultural uh, ideas and products. Uh, things that they believe in, the environment, and how they're supposed to care for the environment, how you should train your children at the same time. And they teach one another as they celebrate their self-reliance and work together. The important thing in this is that in self-reliance groups, where you're teaching one another how they teach themselves to creating the self-reliance groups. You celebrate when they earn a, what we call a master's of business in the street. Basically, you can get a certificate 
if you will go through the lessons and join a self-reliance group, have a service project, have a home project, set up a business with your six simple P's, you can get a, a diploma or a certificate. This is the city of Quito in Ecuador. This is uh, Quesavedo in Ecuador. Here's one from uh, uh, Santo Domingo in Ecuador as you're celebrating working together in self-reliance. You can create self-success ambassadors. Uh, we're working with some Franciscan priests and a church in Paraguay. We're working with the, Asuncion, uh, the city of Asuncion. Here's an NGO in the Congo. Here is the Lions Club, also in Paraguay. Here's an LDS church stake in, uh, in uh, Quesavedo. In, um, and here is a, a school in the Al uh, Altos, uh, in the Andes Mountains, in uh, um, uh, Ecuador, in Otavalo. And they're now teaching business to all of their graduates. 17 years old, you, have to, you can graduate from high school, but only if you know how to run a simple business. So they're selling uh, uh, there's, there's some honey and trout and, and all kinds of different fun things. Here is a, just a, new, a notice, the lady, the first lady of Guyana has adopted the program of self-reliance and they're uh, sending self-reliance all around uh, that country. Now, I share this to, to just let you know that we can eradicate poverty. But we have to do it through self-reliance. We can just power in drop in, give as much as we want to give without thinking always of self-reliance. It would be an honor to work together to be able to do anything we can to be able to make that come to pass here in Rotary and around the world. Thank you very much. We do have a few minutes if anyone would have any questions. And you can just cut me off when we're done. Yes. How do you sustain the momentum that you have? It seems to me it's a, not a hit and a miss, but that you, there's no <coughs> policy that in, encourages the education and so forth that sustains the idea of self-reliance. Yeah, the challenge always is, is uh, sustaining an energy, right? How do you keep the energy to keep a group going? That's true of Rotary Club running routes. Who's your leaders? How does the leadership happen? Uh, in this situation, there's two ways to do that. One is we work through NGOs often, like through the churches and the schools and the NGOs, and they provide uh, sometimes staff and so on to help keep things motivated and going, and we have an online training and support that we give for free. The other is the Masters of Business in the Street program in which uh, you could become uh, a smart, intelligent person that doesn't have a job. You could become a success ambassador and teach MBS. You can charge. Uh, go to your local uh, people and charge 20 to 30 to 40 dollars or whatever you think the market will bear. Go to the government and you can set up your own business being an MBS um, manager, if you will, success ambassador. And then they have the energy to keep that moving because there's a financial incentive. They create a job, plus they teach other people how to create jobs. And it's almost kind of like a 